Tonight, I'll be eating chicken fajitas and queso from Uncle Julio's in Skokie. Cheers. I win again, Patrick. But, sir, Patrick. Grasping for the pictures on the wall Remembering those days where I felt ten feet tall Indestructible youth ran its course until the day you came along Nowadays I find peace inside All the little victories throughout these lines The worry rage is fiercely but I know it's fine Cause you still haven't taken all my pride run from things that I've once loved, praying for miracles, and then you fired the gun, hoping I'd fall down, for what it's worth, I still held on, now you're shaking my self-worth, you took that child away, you saw me at my worst, now you're the only one here these days. But you're the one who caused that anyway So dear time, I hope You'll find it inside your heart to let me cope Forgive me for my anger, this is all I've known Just let me find my way back home Cause waiting up on you is getting old Let's do it. Time out. Time out. Time out. That was almost cool. But why are you guys all over there? 
Why are you all over there? Uh, I guess that's the cool side, and this is the uncool side. I guess, I guess you two are way cooler than we are. All right, let's try that again, but with channel blank unmuted. Yeah? Oh, we got a thumbs up. Let's do it. <laughs> Let it 
to kill be everything I say to God in prayer to God in prayer take it to, to God, God in prayer to God in prayer what a friend oh what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins Grieves to bear away a bridge The days to can be everything To God in prayer To God in prayer So easy to God To God in prayer To God in prayer Oh, what peace We all think for And oh, what needless pain we bear So unnecessary and it's all Because we do not care Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. The right thing you know it's too loud probably tell I, I did um I did uh, take a little bit off the top um, and I, I've noticed that with the light speeding down on my my scalp it just it gets really hot up here <laughs> are you guys are you guys a little hot right out there is it warm how's the temperature if you if you don't feel like me you weren't dancing enough okay whatever Bree you can take it <laughs> But uh, keep your arms down because we've got some pet stains going on. <laughs> Just letting everybody know. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for worshiping with us at home, people. Thank you guys for worshiping with us as well. But do not fret. There will be more songs at the end. I have to keep my pits down. I've got to look for my mom. So I'm just going to hold my arms like this. Um, anyways, now we've come to a time in our service where we are going to let our kids and students go to their classes, and we're going to cheer for them. Yeah! Yeah! Beautiful. All right, parents, if you have children at home, if you want to go to the point, W 
UH downward, all of our kids' stuff and what they're going to learn today and all what they learned throughout all of quarantine is also uh, on that website. So you parents who are in the building, if you have a child who has a white tag, you guys are already going. All right, children that came through fourth grade are this way, fifth through sixth grade is this way. You can go to your classes. The head of security will meet you guys either way. Very cool. All right, now adults and 7th and 8th graders who are here also. Um, we are so excited that you guys are here. Um, just letting you guys know, if you have your phones um, out with you, or if you want to borrow your neighbors, um, if you guys want to go to the pointwh.org as well, um, during our sermon time, so that uh, you can see the notes and see all the events and things that we have going on here for our church family. So before, maybe I should have said before you do that. Anyways, if you guys are in the building, why don't you turn to your neighbor and ask them, or maybe tell them what your favorite Thanksgiving side dish is, okay? If your favorite part of Thanksgiving is turkey, you have a problem, go see Tom in the back. He'll go pray for you. Got it? Very cool. He will be there all service if you need prayer for the food that you need or whatever, okay? But if you are online, Christine and Ruth, um, we're also going to ask you the same questions. Make sure you tell Christine and Ruth online if you are watching from your home or your bathroom, whatever. Favorite Thanksgiving side dish. There you go. spiking again and to be honest with you uh, this weekend was kind of tough for us to pull off here at North Point Church excuse me at the Point Church I don't even know where North Point Church is we need to put that jar like right here as a reminder okay um, but uh, anyway it's, it was kind of tough because we had a lot of people who are volunteers normal volunteers who are quarantined right now and so we were scrambling to get people in place and in line and so particularly those of you who are live here with us today in the building, uh, be watching your emails, be watching social media. Uh, we may have to go back to virtual, um, and, I, and that's not necessarily what we want to do, but it may be something that is essential for us to do here uh, in the near future. So be watching that. There may be an announcement coming out. Uh, we want to keep the, the doors open to the building, but if not, you guys know this. We can close the doors of the church building, but that does not shut down the church, right? You guys are witnesses to that. You guys are part of that. Yeah, praise God, because God continues to work through his church. Um, the point, church, this is why we're here, right? Is to welcome the unchurched to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. And we can do that in this building. 
uh, and we can do that outside of this building. And so uh, we're just pointing people to God, pointing people to Jesus, pointing people to an amazing community, which is the church. And so we are glad you guys are here with us uh, today. We're wrapping up a series. And I don't know about you, I hope that you have gotten a lot out of this series. I know that I have. Uh, it's a series just simply entitled Thriving in Babylon. And it's been off the book, uh, based upon the book uh, Thriving in Babylon by Larry Osborne. So I hope that you guys have been encouraged by this. Those of you who have been participating, whether on our weekend services or life group, um, I think that we have learned a lot about how we can not only just uh, survive, but thrive in a culture that is leaning more and more post-Christian, that looks a lot more like the Babylon of Daniel's day. I think we've learned a lot, or at least, again, I have, um, how to, and, and, and instead of throwing in the towel during these times, that we can be encouraged in our faith, how we can trust a sovereign God, how we can find hope for eternal life even in this home that we're living in, how to have an attitude of gratitude, even in the hardships and the trials that we're going to face, and to humbly treat people with love and respect, even in this culture um, that is becoming more and more apparently godless. And so if you've missed any of the last few weeks, uh, I would encourage you to go to the point, uh, wh.org and look at the sermons there on our website if you want to catch up or share those with somebody you think would benefit from it. So today, as we wrap up, what I want to do is there's been many characteristics of Daniel uh, that we've looked at, and uh, they've been challenging, to say the least, but maybe this might be the most challenging of all. Um, and we're going to look at what, what we're labeling as the wisdom of Daniel, the wisdom of Daniel, how to live wisely. You know, when you look at Daniel, one of the things that I think he knew how to do, and he had much wisdom is, is learning to compromise, learning how to stand firm, when to stand firm in your convictions, and when he knew that maybe there were some created laws, some created rituals, some created religion that was put into place to keep him from falling into temptation. You know, so that's what I want to look at today. <coughs> I don't know about you, but I think this is going to be good, at least for me, okay? <laughs> you guys can come along on the ride if you like, but this is, this is going to be good. I, I might be just preaching to myself today, but I think all of us, to some degree, might be able to get something out of this. Because let me ask this question. How many of you struggle? <laughs> you heard this word just a second ago, and how many of you got a little wigged out, especially those of you who are Christians, when I say the word compromise, Right? How many of you struggle with the word compromise? Especially as Christians, because we think, if we think compromise, faith, right, we think those two things cannot go together, right? I mean, that's, just, that's kind of how I was raised, right? But I look at Daniel, and not only did he have hope, but he, he also had humility, but I think one of the things we can glean from him is wisdom to pick his battles incredibly carefully. What lines are you going to draw in the sand? And, and kind of looking at Daniel and saying, how did he do that? Because the reason I look at Daniel and say, man, this guy had it going on. And I, and I brought this up many, many weeks over the last few weeks. Um, when you think about Daniel, think about the position that he was in. Daniel, whose name was changed by this ruthless, godless king, right? His name given to him by his parents was a godly name, right? <coughs> it honored, excuse me, Jehovah God, and yet his name was changed to Satan's prince. In other words, this Nebuchadnezzar guy who took him captive said, hey, look, we're just going to change your name. I know your parents gave you this God-honoring name, but we're going we're gonna to change it to one that honors our pagan gods. And, and, and when you read about Daniel, at least in his memoirs, we don't see that he gives much pushback on that. Not much at all. When you read his memoirs, you understand that he was kind of forced to study astrology and the occult, right? And, and, and he, see, if it was me, I'd be sitting in the back of the class going, yeah, whatever. Not him. He sat at the front of the class and actually graduated the top of his class. I'm going to share with you why that's important here in a little bit. 
He didn't, he didn't seemingly upset when he was castrated and forced to work under this godless, evil king who had destroyed his hometown. How many of you love your hometown? I mean, I love my hometown. His hometown was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. And did I mention he was castrated? I mean, it just, that's, and, and, and yet it does, he doesn't really seem to be bothered by it. And I'm like, holy smokes. And, and, then, and, and then you think about this. This is huge. This Old Testament evil king destroys the temple of God. And then takes artifacts from the temple of God, Yahweh God, back to the pagan temple, sets them up to mock God. And all the time, you look at this, and Daniel, I don't know how he did it, made compromises. Because if I'm in Daniel's shoes, I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, time out. Not going to honor you, not going to do the things you want me to do. And if I do them, I'm going to do them poorly. Forget you, forget, but not Daniel, (laughs) He was wise and chose his battles wisely, carefully. However, I will say this, even though he chose his battles, there were times where he did stand up. He stood in the gap and said, okay, this is the line, I'm not going to cross it. One of those times is kind of interesting and it kind of sticks out to me, um, and you'll, you'll know why here in just a second is that he didn't step across the line in some dietary orders, right? There was a line in which he had to, God had asked that they eat a kosher meal or kosher diet, right? And this is one of the things where Daniel would not cross the line. When, when the king says, I want you to eat my food. Can you imagine that? See, I, 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 I'm, I can't imagine this because the king's food would have been Giordano's pizza. The king's food would have been all the rich stuff, right? It would have been Coke, not just Coke Zero. It would have been all the delicious food, all, it would have been like Thanksgiving every day, right? Pumpkin pie with all the whipped cream you wanted on it. It had been, you know, that that corn casserole stuff. I don't even know what's in it, but it's, it's, what's in it is delicious, right? You just open up a box of delicious and put it in with some corn and stir it up and cook it. I don't know, but it's, it's great. And, and so that's what the king would have had. And, and then Daniel and his friends would have been on the kosher diet. And so he sticks to his guns. And, he, and he, he wisely, he humbly, but standing his ground, comes to the king and says, he just asks very politely, is there anything that we can do about this? And the king honors his request and he puts him to a 10-day test. Okay? And so... After the 10 days, the guys that were eating the kosher meal, the godly meals, the godly food versus the kingly food were in much better shape than the ones who weren't. And so he was able to stick with this kosher diet. He stuck to his guns. Now, here's the amazing thing. When I read through Daniel's story, this is what I, this is what I see. Whenever Daniel stuck to his guns, he stuck to his guns. And he was willing to face the consequences of whatever he was going to face. Okay, but there were also times where he was just like, eh, I can compromise in these areas. So many areas, it just didn't seem like it was worth the fight. And, and when I read these, I don't know about you, when I read this, if Daniel's a good Jewish boy, he knows the law, why is he just kind of throwing out some of these laws? <laughs> why is he doing that? Because it really confused me, somewhat bothers me, because I'm sitting here going, you know, doesn't that demonstrate that Daniel had a, a lack of faith? I mean, if he didn't stick to his guns continuously, doesn't that show just a lack of faith on his part? And so I get really confused. Because think about this. How many of you who are Christians, how many of you who are Christ followers in here today, admit that if we give any sort of compromise on our convictions, if you give any kind of compromise on your convictions, You've been ingrained that that is compromising your faith, right? Am I I right? Because that's how I was raised. If you give in on your convictions, you're you're kind of giving up. You're stepping back. You're not honoring God. If I compromise in this area, dude, I, I must not be honoring God correctly. So how do we, here's the question, how do we as Christians 
determine the lines that we won't cross and the things that we can compromise on. How do we determine the lines that uh, we can never cross, these are lines that we cannot cross, and ones that we can compromise on? And some of you are hoping that I will put a list on the screen. (laughs) And that's not going to happen. I want you to think through it on your own. I think you need to come up and you need to look at scripture and you need to talk with God and you need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life to, to, to know what those lines are. But I will say this. Here's the first thing that I want you to consider. Consider this. There is a huge difference between what God forbids and just things we don't like. I, I'm going to step on toes this morning. I can see that already. There's a huge difference between what God forbids and just simply things that we as Christians don't like. In other words, there are standards that God places upon his people, but I'm going to tell you something. God didn't set those standards for all people. Look at how Paul says it. I love how Paul says it. He says it so much better than I can. In 1 Corinthians 5, he says this. Now I'm writing to you, you Christians in Corinth, the church in Corinth, he says, I'm writing you that that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. Don't even eat with such people. When I read that this week, I'm like, holy smokes, you should have seen who I was eating with last week, right? J.C. Crawford was over to my... No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) Right? Uh, But I want you to understand. You've heard me say this. How many of you heard me say time and time and time again, context is king. When you're reading the context of a passage of Scripture, the context of that passage must drive the principle of that passage. This passage is actually talking about church discipline. This is Christian on Christian. This is not Christian with non-Christian. This is totally important, okay? There's a list of sins that we're told that if a believer does not have an unrepentant heart towards these sins, to disassociate with them. That's what it says. If they have an unrepentant heart, we have to separate from them. However, look at what Paul said right before this in 1 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 9. He says, Now, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world, meaning the unchurched, the the non-Christians, who are immortal and greedy and swindlers and idolaters. In this case, you would just have to leave. It would be better for you just to leave the world. Now, what God is saying through Paul is this. We're told not to separate. Do you hear me on this? We're told not to separate from unchurched people, non-believers. Because here's the big idea. You and I as Christians are called to have influence on the world. And Paul says this. And basically what he's saying is this. If you don't want to influence non-Christians, it's better for you just to die and go to heaven. I mean, this is what he says. He says... It's better just to leave this world. I'll put it in my context. It's better for you to just die and go to heaven. Because i got a job for you to do. And if you don't want to do the job, just, you know, get out of the way so other people can. <laughs> it is, is what he's saying. So the characteristic of wisdom, of knowing what battles and hills are to fight, have been really key to Daniel. I think those were key to Daniel, and I think they need to be key to us. Think about this. Remember, I, thought, I, I said this earlier. Daniel was forced i got to mute my phone. Somebody's dinging me. Do you not know where I'm at? All right. Should have just thrown it. Anyway. So Daniel, remember, was forced to study astrology in the occult. Okay? And, and now he knew there was commands and laws. God's law said, don't practice these things. Don't get caught up into these things. But he also knew there was nothing in God's law that says you can't study these things. And this is amazing. This is cool. If you watch this, this is so cool. So when, when Daniel graduates the top of his class, okay, when he graduates top of his class, rather than refusing to take of the class, or rather sitting in the, black of the back of the class and, and getting a, you know, a D, he says, no, 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 no. 
there's some cool stuff that's going to happen with this. And you can see this in Daniel chapter 2. You see, he was able to tell the king, after studying this, after becoming an expert in astrology, an expert in the occult, when the king comes to him and needs him to decipher some dreams and some things that are going on, you know what Daniel's able to say? King, I've studied this stuff. As a matter of fact, I've become an expert in this stuff. I was at the top of my class. I'm better than any of the other astrologers. I'm better than any of these guys that are practicing this, you know, Babylonian, whatever, dark art stuff. And he says this, this stuff is crap. This stuff is junk. This stuff doesn't work. And instead, he's able to point to God because God allows Daniel to interpret a dream of Nebuchadnezzar that nobody else could. Isn't that amazing how God worked that out? Because Daniel was able to compromise and study something that he didn't even believe in. He was able to look at something in depth that he didn't believe in. He knew that it was against God, but he studied it to be able to overcome it and point people back to God. And it started with compromise. God gave him Nebuchadnezzar dreams and he gave Daniel the answers to answer that. It wasn't from that mumbo jumbo dark arts stuff. It was, it, it came from God. And, and so Daniel, because he became an expert, was able to point him to God. It started with compromise. So there are certainly times and place that we need to stand strong, right? There are certainly times where we need to make sure that, the, that we don't cross the line. We don't break. We don't compromise. And I believe this. You need to have wisdom to understand what those are. Because sometimes what happens is, here, here's what happens. There's two traps that we can fall into. All of a sudden, we believe there's a line right here that we can't cross, right? Here's the line. All of a sudden, we think that if we believe this is the line, this is the place, if I'm uncomfortable by crossing this line, it must be that nobody else can cross that line either. Okay? Here's the line that we believe that God has given us, and if anybody else is on the other side of the line, they must be sinning. Can I tell you something? That's a misnomer. That's, that's a line that you put in the sand. Here's the other thing. What God asked me to do as a Christian, sometimes we feel like, okay, God is calling me to do something. Well, if God's calling me to do something, he must be calling everybody else to do it. And that's another misnomer. Just because God is calling you to do something doesn't mean he's calling everybody to do something. Am I stretching any, anybody in here yet today? Because I was stretched by this. I'm going to bring this around here in a little bit. Bear with me. Some of you are wanting to take me out back and stone me right now. All right. <laughs> That's, hang on. We're going to bring this around. Because how many of you have been in a situation... I guarantee it's become more and more prevalent. How many of you have gotten into a situation, whether it's at work or at home, whatever, where your personal convictions were challenged? Right? It happens. And it happens more and more because you know if you stand up, okay, you know the line is right. And if you stand up for what you believe in, for your convictions, if you stand up, it's going to cost you. It may cost you a lot. It may cost you your job. It may cost you friendships. It may cost you family members. It may cost you influence in the community if you take this stand. So how do we hold on to convictions and trust that God will provide? And how do we live with conviction and avoiding fear of, oh my gosh, we just crossed the line? How do we do that? Here's my suggestion. Conviction, courage, wisdom in Babylon, I have one suggestion for you, okay? I'm going to bring this home into one suggestion. My suggestion for you today is for you to consider this. Can we just stop being scaredy-cat Christians? See, I use the cat reference. Can we just stop being scaredy-cat Christians? And a scaredy-cat Christian is simply this, somebody who gives Satan far too much credit. Now think about this. These are the kind of people, and maybe you're one of these people, so you have to do some self-reflection today. These are Christians, yet somehow we've become afraid 
that if we go to an event, if we practice some holiday, if we go to some place, if we have some of these things, if we listen to that song, if we look at that media, if we're around those people, if I eat this food or if I drink that drink, or if there's certain words that someone says, if somehow me being associated with those things by osmosis, I'm going to become evil. <laughs> you, see, you see where I'm going with this, right? And guys, we need to remember. We need to remember Satan is powerful. He's a deceptor. And he is the father of lies. He's a father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. He is a liar. Jesus said this about him. In John 8, 44, he says this. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out, his, out of his own character. He is a liar and the father of lies. Here's the deal. Sometimes what can happen as Christians, we can start to believe his lies. We can start to believe his lies. And we end up thinking that anything that might slightly be touched by Satan... Anything that can be slightly used by non-Christians or non-believers, if we are associated with that at all, somehow by osmosis, we're going we're gonna to be the same thing. We're, we're going to fall into the trap. Somehow, it's going to bring us down. But I want to remind you guys today, if you're watching online, if you're in here today, I want you to remember, as powerful as Satan is, as much of a liar as he is, he doesn't have that much power. Because greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. 1 John 4.4, 4. and I'm glad that like three of you agree with me. You dear brothers and children are, are, are from God and have overcome them being Satan's little minions. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. God's power is demonstrated. Listen to me. God's power is demonstrated. God's power is demonstrated when Satan, what Satan means for evil, God redeems and brings life to. What Satan means to kill... God means to bring life. What Satan means to destroy, God means to redeem. What Satan means to separate, God means to reconcile. What Satan means to put in the grave, God means to resurrect. So when we fall, when we fall into this mindset of being scaredy crack Christians, what we tend to do is, I've got to be honest with you, we tend to make God look weak. When, when non-church people, when, when non-believers look at us, and all of a sudden, we're like, we can't go to this place, we can't hang out here, we can't do those things, whatever the case may be, they're looking at you and going, so, so your God's all-powerful, huh? So, you, so your life's been transformed, huh? So it's no longer you, but Christ in you that lives, huh? Because something isn't matching up. Something doesn't look right. What happens is we can fall into two easy traps of scaredy cat Christians. One of those being legalism. Oh, I'm going there. Hang on. Legalism is just simply adding rules to the Bible that aren't there. Scaredy cat Christians, because we're afraid that God's going to get angry, all of a sudden we start setting up extra rules so we don't fall into the temptations that God has set up these certain lines, and so we just put in some extra rules because what we're going to do is we're going to help God out. Right? We're, we're going to help God out in this situation. He didn't really give us a complete Bible for us to know the lines, and so we're going to help God out. We're going to add some extra rules to this, okay? It's legalism. And legalism is funny because legalism always sounds like it's Scripture because we'll take a piece of Scripture and, and then we'll, we'll make something that, yeah, this is legitimate, and then we'll just add a bunch of other stuff to it that's not necessarily in the Bible, okay? And so, so legalism is, we're just, help, we're just gonna help God out by adding some things that he missed. He, missed. he totally missed this, Mark, right? So we, we gotta add some stuff, right? Because you can't sing a secular song in church, right? And if you do that, that's, that's lines crossed. 
But you realize there's nothing in the Bible about that, right? You, should, you, you really need to stop watching TV. Now, a few weeks ago, I said, so you really need to stop watching TV. However, you know, because you need to spend your time more wisely. So we're going to just stop watching TV so that we can spend more time in the Bible. Where you, can, you, know, and all, you know, even though I suggested that, do you realize that's not biblical? There's nothing in the Bible about that. Or you need to stop drinking beer. Okay? Now, for some of you, that would be a good idea. But the Bible doesn't say, it does talk about drunkenness. And some of you, you fall into that temptation, so you need to stop drinking beer. However, that's not biblical. The Bible doesn't say that. How about this? Don't dance. If you dance, you're going to fall into sexual temptation, and then things are going to happen. Now, I will say this. For some of you, that's a good thing, because I do a lot of weddings, and I've been there. I think they wait for me to leave the door, because I go back in, and I'm like, what is happening in this place? Right? So it might be a good idea that you don't dance the way some people dance, but it's not a biblical thing. It's not in the Bible. Here's a, here's a good one. You've got to get yourself all cleaned up before you come to Jesus. You know, you've got to stop doing this, start doing this, start doing this, stop doing, you know, all these different things you've got to put in place before you come and meet Jesus. And that's not biblical at all. As a matter of fact, what's more biblical is this. It doesn't matter where you are, what you've done, how far away from God you've gotten, Jesus will meet you there and take you where you need to be. Oh, should we talk about baptism? How many of you are waiting for your life to get cleaned up to get in the baptistry? That's not biblical. As a matter of fact, what the Bible says is as soon as you believe, you get in the tank, you get underwater, you come up a new, resurrected person in Jesus Christ. You are transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's something about that water because of your obedience that he transforms your life even further. Don't wait. Waiting is not biblical. <laughs> right? But I've got to go through these classes first. See, you guys have got me off on a tangent now. Now I'm going to just start making fun of the church. I won't do that. I love the church. All right? So here's what happens. We start making extra rules so that we can help God out. You see, God puts a fence up, okay? God says, okay, don't cross this. And what happens is we start putting up other fences, okay? We start putting up other fences so that we don't fall into the temptation to cross that fence. Can I tell you something? Putting extra fences up in your own life for your sake is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not a biblical thing. And here's why I'm spending so much time on this. The people outside the church, the non-church, the non-believers are looking at us. And what we've preached far more than the fence that God put up was the fences that we've put up. And they read the Bible themselves. They look at it themselves. And they hear what the church is saying. And they go, something doesn't add up. You guys are crazy. And so we've got to stop being scared to teach truth. This is what God said. This is where God's fence is. Let's preach the fence and not all these man-made fences that we put in place. Because there's people outside that are looking in going, wait a second, time out. Something doesn't add up. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. Paul talks about it. Look what he says to the church in Colossians. He says this in, in Colossians chapter 2. He says, do you realize you died with Christ? And he's, he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep following the rules, man-made rules, of the world such as don't handle, don't touch, don't taste? Such rules are merely human teachings about things that are detrimental as, as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Hear me on this. We will never make God look bad. Christians, we will never make God look bad when we stay in line with his rules. But we will always make him look weak when we add extra rules to his. That's legalism. Let's get to point two. 
Some of you are going to really like this one, okay? I'm calling point two of scaredy cat Christians that we need to avoid is something like this. Have you ever heard of spiritual cooties? Okay, spiritual cooties. How many of you grew up in the area where you played cooties out in the elementary school, right? And you remember this? Oh, they got cooties. So you didn't touch this person. If you touch this person, now you've got cooties. And it was just a weird game of tag. Actually, do you realize this hasn't necessarily stopped as adults? We just play it more cruelly. This is what it is. Instead of redeeming the things that Satan has defiled... Instead of allowing God to redeem the things that Satan has defiled, we think, again, somehow by osmosis, that we will contradict, uh, contract spiritual contamination if we are around bad things or bad things touch us. Spiritual cooties are people who feel like if you rub shoulders with a Satan worshiper or somebody who's a non-Christian, it undercuts everything that Jesus Christ did on the cross. Did that step on anybody yet? Because if you befriend or hang out with a non-believer or non-church person, somehow you're going to, by osmosis, lose your salvation. I remember, uh, Dennis, we were on that trip to Desalines, Haiti, one of the first Desaline trips that we took. It was a medical trip. And we were working in the hospital in Desalines. And uh, I, I had the amazing, awesome privilege to work with the chaplain there. Pastor Herantz, amazing dude, amazing guy. And uh, before the, the people, the patients were coming in to, to the doctors uh, for their checkups and, and whatever they were needing, their medical attention, uh, we would do a devotion every morning. We'd get up and go early and have a devotion. There'd be hundreds of people out there. And, and so we were able to, to just do a brief devotion and pray with these people. And then we would start making rounds around the hospital the, the chaplain and I, and, and, and we would just pray with people. It was great. It was amazing. Saw some amazing things on that trip. Some heartbreaking things, but some amazing things on that trip. I'll never forget one. One of them was a guy who was laying in this bed, and he was terribly sick, tremendously sick, very ill, okay? And so as we were making our rounds, we get to this gentleman, and, and, and we could tell that he just wasn't into the conversation. I, you know, I don't know why, but he just wasn't much into the conversation and so Pastor Hermans, he says, Tim, do you want to pray and I'll interpret for you? And I'm like, absolutely. So we start praying for this guy. And all of a sudden, as soon as I said something to the effect, and Jesus, please heal this man, the eyes roll back into his head. He starts convulsing in a strange way that I had never witnessed before. And all of a sudden, I'm praying harder. Pastor Hermans doesn't stop praying. There's something going on that as soon as the, we invoked Jesus' name, I'm telling you something, whether you believe in this kind of stuff or not, there was a spirit in that man that wasn't happy. And we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed until, and we prayed that that spirit would be removed from this gentleman to be cast out. I wish I had a follow-up story to that. I wish I knew where that man was at today. Because I do believe that he was healed that day. Not by our power, not by our prayers, but by the power of Jesus Christ in that man's life. You see how I got Baptist there for a minute? Jesus Christ. <laughs> it was powerful stuff. But I get questions. I'll share, I've shared this story with just a few people. Now I've shared it with a, several more. Um, but I'll get this question. Weren't you scared? Weren't you scared? This is what I will tell you. The hairs on the back of my neck did stand up a bit because I'd never seen anything quite like that before. However, I wasn't scared. And I prayed, and Pastor Harantz prayed, and we prayed because I'll tell you what I believed at the time, and I still believe it today, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. That greater is he who is in me than the one who is in the world. That it's not by my strength, but the strength of God himself. When we recognize our weaknesses, that's when we see God do his best. So I want to finish this today. I want to close out this series today with some very powerful words that God spoke to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10, if you haven't read Daniel chapter 10, you should. It's a great chapter. Actually, it's Jesus.
that shows up in this vision that Daniel has. Watch what this says. In Daniel 10, starting in verse 17, this is what Daniel says to Jesus. He says, how can someone like me, your servant, talk to you, O Lord? My strength is gone, and I can barely breathe. Can I just stop right there? How many of you right now, this is you, where you would say, my strength is gone. Everything that I've been pouring into this marriage, everything that I've been trying to do for my kids, I've been trying to fight this spiritual battle in my family, in my church, in my community, and I've been fighting for this for so long. I've been trying to figure out this whole financial thing, but the more I try to get ahead, the more I get behind. My health is not good. My my, my spouse's health, my kids' health is not good, and I've been fighting, and the weight of the world is on my shoulders, and my strength is gone. And I can barely... I can barely breathe. Please lean in. Then the one who looked like man is Jesus. Then Jesus touched me. And I felt my strength return. Don't miss this. When he touched me, I felt my strength returning. Some of you, maybe many of you, this is why you're here today. This is it. This is your God moment. You need that one touch today to have your faith returned. You need that one touch to remember that you're with Jesus Christ. You need that one touch to believe in that thing that you had put off, that you used to believe in God, and, but you haven't believed in God in a long time in this one area. And maybe that one touch, it's returning today. One touch is enough to keep you going. One touch, you can feel your strength returning. One touch is the presence of Jesus, and everything changes. I have no more strength, but one touch and I'm feeling my strength returning. And in Christ, he says this, and in Christ says this, verse 19, I want you to hear this. Verse 19, do not be afraid, for you're very precious to God. Have peace, be encouraged, be strong. Again, some of you need to hear this today. Thank God's sight, you're precious. He wants you to have his peace. He wants you to have his strength. When this comes, he touches us. When we start to feel this, then you can say, just like Daniel, as, as he spoke these words to me, I suddenly felt stronger and said to him, please speak to me more, Lord, <laughs> for you have strengthened me. Listen, we need to stand in our faith. We need to stand strong. Maybe, do you realize that the first time that you prayed to God, God answered your prayer? Whatever the prayer was, God answered your prayers. When he touches you, when he's reaching out to you, he strengthens you, and you're able to stand strong even in the midst of the trials and the hardships. You're able to have that hope with humility and wisdom. You're able to hear the words that God has for you. And when you have those words of God, not only can you just survive, but you can thrive. Whatever Babylon you're facing. Some of you right now, deep down in your souls, you have to realize, you have a weakness. I have a weakness. And our greatest weakness is our sin. We're sinful. But understanding our greatest weakness allows us also to understand and to receive the greatest power that has ever come to this earth. And that is the power of Jesus Christ. When Jesus cried and lived lived without sin and died and rose again, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You're forgiven and you're transformed. That's the greatest strength that has ever been placed upon this earth. 
I guess I would just say this. There are people here today. Maybe you've been watching online and you're just watching online today. But you're here right now. For this moment, right now, at this moment, because there's a battle inside of you that's raging and you have the choice. Do I continue fighting on my own strength where I'm getting to a point where I can barely breathe or do you just surrender that to God and allow him to touch you to bring the strength needed to survive and thrive in our battle? Now the moment is here. So can you say, by faith, I surrender to Christ. I give my life to him. I turn from my sins. My life belongs to him. Without him, I am nothing, and he is my everything. Can I just tell you, please, 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 never think that you're too insignificant for God. You are precious in his sight. Jesus died for you. And now his spirit lives in you. You've died to the old sinful ways. You've been transformed into the new person that God is creating you to be. And he has called us to share this light into the darkness. But for us to shine light into the darkness, guess where we have to go? Into the darkness. But God's light will crush that darkness. But we have to be obedient to go. My friends, we're living in Babylon. We're in a post-Christian culture. But we do not fear. We will, with courage, live on and fight on because we have hope. And we will live out this hope with humility and the wisdom of God. And therefore, we will not only survive, but my friends, we will thrive in Babylon. Yes, sir. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric, one of the elders here at the Point Church. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell because I don't have enough gray hair yet, but we're getting there. This is our time for communion. We have tables set up here at the front of the stage and in the back corner. Over to the, my right, we have a prayer table with Mr. Tom King and his cheerleading sections back there. Anytime you guys need prayer or if you were moved by today's sermon, I know I was, you know, I could feel where Tim was coming from. Stop back there. Let's pray with you. Let's talk. You know, anything we need that we can do for you, we'll do. Communion is our time to come together as a church family and celebrate the sacrifice our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made for us. Through his death on the cross, we have been given the gift of everlasting life and forgiveness of our sins. 1 John 3.16 reads, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, I take a piece of scripture, and then I try to find something in the world that I can relate it to so that it makes more sense to me when I, have to, when I do a communion. And nowhere can I find a better living example of 1 John 3.16 than in our U.S. military, men and women. This past Wednesday was Veterans Day. Veterans Day was originally Armistice Day that ended World War I. And then we changed it to Veterans Day to celebrate everyone who has served or is serving in our military now. It's not a day to go get a good deal on bedroom furniture or 5,000 off a brand new car, which is kind of sad that we do that. But ever since I was a little kid, I've loved and been fascinated by war documentaries, war stories. You know, anytime I had to do a book report in school, it, it was some facet of war. I've seen thousands of hours of documentaries, read hundreds of books on it. But the stuff that I enjoy the most are the stories from the mouths of the people that were there. You know, these are mostly kids that were shipped off to foreign countries to do a task that I could not imagine doing myself. And through, you know, the trials and experiences that they had, they would form a bond that people like me have never served would never understand. One thing that really sticks out to me is how much these guys, men and women, would depend on each other to stay alive. You know, you were dependent on the person next to you. And they would go through extraordinary measures to take care and protect their fellow soldier, even to the point of sacrificing their own lives to save their fellow men. This is a love and a bond that I'm really in awe of any time that I think of it. And as Jesus sacrificed himself out of his love for us, we can find that same type of sacrificial love around us today. I want to thank all of our servicemen and women for what they have done for us and showing us what unconditional love can be today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful day that we can come together and worship and praise you. Father, thank you for the gift of eternal life through the sacrifice of your only son. Your love for us is something that we have a hard time wrapping our minds around. Father, as you show your great love for us, teach us how to love others in the same way. Lord, thank you for the brave men and women who have served their fellow man by protecting our country in times of need. Because of them, we are able to gather together freely and worship you without fear. We love you, Father, and it's in your Son's most holy name we pray. Amen.
the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk across the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. Faith will be made stronger in the presence of my
sing Amen.
youth group. Um, when somebody says something nice about you, or when somebody says something, um, whether they speak a prophecy over you, is something small, something big, we always look at each other and say, I received that. So if you read those words today, if you sung that in your soul and you received that blessing, because it was a blessing for you and your children and everyone else that comes after you, I hope that you are receiving that blessing that God has for you today. Very cool, we got one amen in the back. Before we let you guys go to whatever the next six and a half days have for you until we officially come back to church again, uh, we're gonna pray. So uh, we have these boxes here and they are full. This one is for a 14 year old boy. So last weekend, uh, us and some family, us as a staff, um, some families from our church and our youth group as well, um, packed hundreds of these boxes. We prayed over them. Uh, these are very intentional. Uh, and they're going to go out into the world for children who, um, whose parents can't do everything that you want to do. So these are blessing boxes, fitting for the song that we just sung. Uh, so we are going to pray over them. Uh, real quick, Sissy, I didn't ask if I could borrow your hat, but I'm, I have it, so it doesn't fit on my head because your head is very small. But anyways, this is my intention. All right, so we're going to pray over these boxes. Extend your hands if you want. Um, people online, thank you for praying. Um, Jesus Christ, we are so thankful for your birth, and even though it's not even Thanksgiving, it's fine. We're celebrating early. Um, we ask for these boxes and the hundreds that are left in the hallway that would just overflood the stage if we brought them out. Uh, we just ask that they would intentionally be placed in the hands of children who need them. I pray very specifically for these boxes uh, right now that a child is wishing that they had some sort of something that is in this box. <laughs> Whether they need a new pair of shoes or new underwear, a new toothbrush, something like that, or a fun toy, God, I, this... <laughs> This is a ministry, and you are using this to spread your love and your goodness. So we also pray for the hands that are going to be putting it on an airplane and walking into villages of people who may or may not even know you. Uh, we ask that your love would be extended in that, and that people can see our faith and not only hear about it. In your name we pray, amen. If you guys liked what you saw today, this is all made possible by your generosity. Go to the, the pointwh.org for more information. Uh, with that, take this blessing once again. Have a great six and a half days. Don't forget how you feel right now. Don't forget how you feel right now. Again, prayer in the back if you guys need it or want it. There's a bunch of pastors over there. Um, online, shoot us a DM if you're feeling some type of way. We're all in this together. Have a good week.
Ring out, Caleb. <laughs> All right. Oh, the ring out. All right. Thank you. 